In the eyes of man, an old idea is about to change. Our concept of time, it will be rewritten. Our words life and death and age all redefined. Toward immortality, man's slow and ancient walk on this planet will become a race. The gain measured in decades, no longer months or single years. The vision, the chance, simply this. That child about to be born will live more years, gather more wisdom, come to know more generations living with the same last name than any human child born in all of history. And it's a journey we've already begun. Today, in government labs, in private labs across the country, scientists are examining the secrets of aging hidden in the chemistry of man. Under their microscopes, the blood cells and antibodies of the immune system, the body's genetic code, the double helix of DNA, the powerful enzymes and hormones that give cells life and then take it away, even the chemical transmitters inside our brain, it is here. Life magnified a thousand times where the researchers work and they are nearer to solving the puzzle of life and death than ever before. Dr. Robert Butler, founding director of the National Institute on Aging. These fields are spectacular. There's just no doubt what they're gonna to continue to take off. They're already taking off. And by the turn of the century, it's just inevitable that we're gonna have many means of intervening in the aging process itself. Immortality, we're already on the way. At the University of California in Los Angeles, pathologist Dr. Roy Walford has dramatically extended the life of laboratory animals, and he says the same techniques could, right now, double the life expectancy of you and me. At the Gerontology Research Center in Baltimore, scientists are at the edge of a new frontier in medical science, studying how we might extend life, not only by curing diseases that come with age, but by slowing down the aging process itself. At the Brookhaven National Lab in New York, for the first time, scientists are photographing the chemical changes in the brain that accompany Alzheimer's disease, the major cause of senility. And they predict a treatment, perhaps even a cure, in the next 20 years. In related work at Letterly Pharmaceutical Labs, Dr. Ray Bartis has found that certain chemicals experimentally infused into the brain can increase the mental ability of old animals as well as human beings. Dr. Howard Hopps, chairman of a National Academy of Sciences study committee, has found that death rates in some parts of this country are twice as high as other areas. He thinks he knows why and what might be done about it. At the University of Texas Health Science Center, again studying lab animals, Pathologists have increased the lifespan of white rats to the human equivalent of 150 years. And when they die, despite their age, many are virtually free of disease. The result of these projects and a thousand others just like them? I think that we are making inroads into life expectancy that will continue into the next century. That average life expectancy will go through the 80s and go through the 90s as we conquer more and more diseases. Other scientists are even more optimistic and predict that our knowledge of human genetics and biochemistry will accelerate so fast in the coming years that by the end of this century, maximum lifespan will reach 140, even 150 years of age. Whether they're right or wrong, this fact remains. You and I, and especially our children, have the potential to live longer than anyone's ever lived before. And that's what the next hour is about what science will do, what you and I can do to lengthen our lives. I'll be right back. If the words toward immortality sound like science fiction, consider how far we've already come. Today, in this nation, death from infectious or parasitic disease is rare or non-existent. Smallpox, scarlet fever, cholera, dysentery, diphtheria, tuberculosis, the great killers of our recent past are now gone, or very nearly so, and the result is a life expectancy today that would have seemed godlike to ancient man. 
2,000 years ago in ancient Rome, half the population was dead by the age of 22. Imagine a life expectancy of just 22 years. And then in the middle of the last century, it jumped to 40 years, and then to about 47 years at the beginning of this century. And today, on average, we will live nearly 75 years. Our life expectancy has almost doubled in just five generations. It's increased 50% since the year our grandparents were born. But there's a problem here. The way we've extended our lives in the past won't work, cannot work in the future. Let me explain what I mean. In the past, each time we've conquered a disease, we've added more years to our lives. But today, even if we were to find a cure for the major diseases left, our life expectancy would only increase a few more years. Let me give you a couple of examples. According to the Public Health Service, if every variety of cancer suddenly disappeared, life expectancy would increase just two years and four months. If tomorrow morning all heart disease was suddenly cured, we would live less than six more years. So if most of us are to live to be 100, 120, even 150 years of age, it won't be by treating specific diseases, but by altering the aging process itself. And that brings us here to a story about two animals, a brown mouse in the pathology lab at UCLA, a white rat at the University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio, and about the two men who study them, Dr. Roy Walford in California, Dr. Edward Massaro in Texas, both well-known, respected pathologists, both learning about longevity in the extraordinary lifespan of their laboratory animals. Let's begin with Dr. Walford. Each week he swims two miles and then runs another 10. You probably wouldn't guess he was 60 years old. What's more, Dr. Walford says at that age, his life is only about half over. 120 years, he says, is his life expectancy, maybe more a belief that comes from the fact that this little brown mouse is still alive. NR-1-243 is her name, born November 5, 1978. She's the oldest mouse in the world, very likely the longest living mouse of all time. For the past four years, she was fed half the calories her 57 brothers and sisters received, all of whom are now dead. The last one died 11 months ago. Since 68, Dr. Walford has been studying the effects of undernutrition on laboratory animals, proving over and over again that if you keep mammals such as rats or mice or other lower animals on a diet characterized by kind of the catchphrase undernutrition without malnutrition, and you do that from time of weaning, that you can greatly extend maximum lifespan undernutrition, not malnutrition. The difference is important. This means that you cut down the total amount of calories in the diet, but you increase the food value per gram of diet. So they're not restricted in essential nutrients. They still get all the proteins, vitamins, minerals, amino acids, essential fatty acids that they should be getting, but it's lower in calories and they live much longer. At the University of Texas, an eight-year research project under feeding white rats has just ended, and the findings are virtually the same. They live about 50% longer. In human terms? In human terms, uh, it would mean if the maximum length of life of a human is 100 years, uh, these animals would be living to 150 years. But perhaps even more important than the long life of these animals is their extraordinary good health, even in old age. We also find that those diseases which are associated with age, in the rat, this being kidney disease and heart disease and cancers and tumors, that these, their, their time of occurrence is delayed. So the animals are much older before they show the disease, or in some cases, such as kidney disease and heart disease, they don't, they don't show it at all. The next question, of course, is what has all this got to do with us? If lab animals live much longer, healthier lives when they're fed about half the food normal rats are given, would fewer calories in our diet each day have the same effect on us? The answers are both yes and no, depending on whom you ask. We don't know if these dietary regimens that we used in rats and have been used by others in mice would work 
in humans. We haven't got a shred of evidence. No one has ever done this kind of study in an animal more complicated than a rat. Dr. Walford disagrees. He says the restricted diet will work on human beings right now. If you took 100 humans and put them on, at the age of 18 to 20, on this kind of a diet, and they stayed on it the rest of their lives, then some of them would live to be 135 to 140. Of course, not all of them. Their average lifespan would probably be uh, 100, 110. 110 years would be life expectancy, in other words, the average length of life. But again, some people would live to be 140 years old. Of course, even if Walford is right, there's some caution required here. Cutting your normal diet in half without getting sick and malnourished isn't easy. It almost takes a computer to keep track of the calories and an encyclopedic knowledge of food to make sure you got just the right nutrients each day. Still, Walford says, if we did it, if we slowly reduced our diet to less than 2,000 calories a day, Americans would dramatically extend their lives, and that's not all. No, they'd be much healthier, those living that long. Be more active, more intellectually active, have a greater sense of physical well-being. They'd be sexually capable and to a much more advanced age than normally fed people, and essentially in every way would be healthier. They, they wouldn't be eating angel food cake every day. <laughs> He's doing it. For the last two and a half years, Dr. Walford has been on a restricted diet, steadily losing weight. Five days a week, he eats about 1,500 calories a day. Two days a week, he eats nothing at all. The result? With a little luck, he says, he will live to be 120 years old, which, according to today's records, would make him the oldest man in human history. But let's back up for a minute, because in a way, we've skipped over the most important question of all. Not how much did these animals eat or how long they lived, but why? What happened inside their bodies that allowed them to live so long? Can we make those same changes and extend our own lives? As we try to find those answers, we come closer to the most fundamental question of all. Why do we age and what can we do about it? Man, like every animal alive, has a chemical defense system on duty 24 hours a day, without which, in a matter of hours, all of us would die. This defense is armed with enzymes, hormones, antibodies of a thousand different kinds that protect us from the natural hazards of life, viruses, bacteria, cancer, even poisons called free radicals produced by our own bodies. The problem, in theory at least, is that this system is just like the rest of us. It grows old, weak, less effective with age, and in the war against disease that begins the day we're born, toward the end of life, the attacking cancer or viruses finally win, the chemical defenders lose, we grow old, and then we die. Now one way to solve this problem is to find a way to kill each disease, one by one, which is what science has been doing for centuries, but there might be another way. We might strengthen the body's own defense and let it kill the disease, whatever it is. In other words, if the most powerful medicine ever designed, the body's own protective chemistry, works so well when we're young, why not just beef it up, somehow reinforce that chemistry when we need it most, in old age? That way we might not only cure diseases that come with age, but prevent aging altogether or at least slow it down. And it is at this frontier that medical science has finally arrived. I feel uh, myself that we'll uh, be extending lifespan by simple means easily before the end of the century. Some areas are increasing the DNA repair rate. There's good evidence that that would extend lifespan. Better information about how to counteract free radicals in the body other ways of handling the deterioration of the immune system. So there are a lot of things coming off the scientific workbench now, and if any of them work, then we'll have a big step forward. He doesn't have much longer to live, at worst a few hours, at most, a few months, perhaps. In fact, according to his doctor, 59-year-old William Keith, retired postman, shouldn't be alive right now. After years of high blood pressure, heavy drinking, and smoking two packs a day, 
only 10% of his heart muscle is still pumping, is still alive. And while this may seem harsh, he is in this condition because, like many of us, in a way, he chose to be. Despite hypertension and a heart attack 12 years ago, he continued to drink and smoke, and sometimes he forgot his blood pressure medication. So now, he can't walk, he can hardly talk, and he can't be sure he'll ever see his wife again after today. The point is, extending human lifespan will come in part because science will find new ways to treat disease and then will find a way to alter aging itself. Beyond that, however, how long we live is and will be largely up to us. And some of the hazards are pretty obvious. Excessive drinking, cigarette smoking, obesity, too much sugar, salt, fat in our food, not enough exercise. But there are other things that aren't obvious at all. Wayne County, Georgia, 45 miles southwest of Savannah, hot, flat farming country, and Julian Griffiths has been making a living from this land for most of his life. 63 years old, he bought this farm almost a half century ago. On it, he's raised wheat, corn, oats, soybeans, hogs, and cows. Because of it, he's cared for a wife and raised two children, a boy who became a farmer, a daughter who married a farmer. And it is this land that may kill Julian Griffiths before his time. He lives in a region of the country that was recently studied by a committee of the National Academy of Sciences. They compared death rates in the southeast with those in the upper Midwest. And it turns out that in this region here, the area where people don't live so long, approximately twice as many of this group died each year as was the case here. So the mortality rate was really uh, almost twice, a really striking difference. Or said another way, 68-year-old Phil Hamilton of Hennepin County, Minnesota, has twice the chance of living for another year as his counterpart in Wayne County, Georgia. But what is it about this land, this 100,000 square miles from Wisconsin to Colorado, that seems to give life? And what is it about that same number of miles from Virginia to Alabama that twice as often seems to take life away? That was the puzzle before the National Academy of Sciences, and the answer came from the land itself. Many more minerals, including both trace elements and other elements, are present in the soil and the water up in the upper Midwest than are present in the uh, South Atlantic group of states. And these are elements that are essential for health, and some of them are absolutely essential for life. In the water especially, there is as much as six times the amount of iron, zinc, copper, chromium, calcium, selenium, magnesium in the upper Midwest as there is in the river and well water of the southeast. In other words, the people of the southeast region have soft water. The water in the Midwest area is hard, and that difference is crucial. People who live in hard water areas are less likely to die of cardiovascular disease than people who live in soft water areas. And when we talk about water, uh, we're talking about water wherever you find it. The fact that milk is mostly water and coffee is mostly water and so is beer and Coca-Cola and a lot of the vegetables that you eat are watermelon is perhaps 90% uh, water. So you, uh, there's some people who say, but I don't drink water. Well, they do in the sense that uh, it's a part of almost everything we consume. Water then, as it runs over the land and filters through the soil, is a source of food. And from that same kitchen faucet, some of us will be nourished, others malnourished, depending on the soil, the geography of where we live. All of which means there is more in that glass of water than most of us ever imagined. And these are essential. If you don't have these things, uh, you're not going to do well. And some of them, if you don't have enough, uh, uh, you're going to die. In fact, I think that today we're at about the stage in our recognition of the importance of trace elements, essential trace elements, as we were in the recognition of the importance of vitamins 50 or 60 years ago. Water. As a source of minerals and trace elements, we don't know enough about that yet. 
But until we do, Dr. Hobbs says it's not a bad idea to call the local water department and ask about the water in your area. If it's short of magnesium, zinc, chromium, whatever, you might consider asking your doctor about a mineral supplement to your diet. That's what Dr. Hops does. He and his wife live in Toledo, Ohio, where the water is relatively soft, and they take a magnesium tablet every day. Well, it's time to move on. And we're set for the 14th annual Peachtree Road Race is underway. The morning of July 4th, the start of one of the more famous 10-kilometer races in America, the Peachtree Road Race in Atlanta, Georgia. And there is one man here, lost among the 28,000 runners, whose name will be written in the record book today just because he's here. He started running just four years ago, and at the age of 75, he's the oldest man in the race. His name is Glenn Calmes. In 1977, he retired from a desk, a job with the government, and went home to his wife and his garden. He was 70 years old. Almost two years later, feeling a little sluggish, a little old, he woke up one morning, early enough so no one would see him, and he started running. Not very far or very long, but for the first time since he was a child, he started running, and it's changed his life. Yeah, I was sluggish beforehand, the muscles and my joints weren't... Uh, I, uh, one thing I can tell you, I had some arthritis before I started running, and the arthritis has all disappeared. So <laughs> it must be good from, you, from, from that standpoint. Still, a couple of questions come to mind here. Did he start too late? Is he too old? Will he somehow hurt himself running six or seven miles at the age of 75? Dr. Herb DeVries, former director of the Physiology Research Lab at the University of Southern California. Uh, the prevailing notion had been that uh, there was no way the older individual was going to improve his uh, strength, his uh, muscular endurance, more importantly his uh, oxygen transport that we all find so important nowadays, uh, his cardiac output by training. Actually, the older individual responds to training very much as does the young. It was once thought, and it's still thought by many people, that the ability of the heart to function declines dramatically with aging. But it turns out that if you exercise animals and man, you may in fact not get this dramatic decrease, that the decline in heart function with aging may be slowed considerably. And that the quality of your function of your heart will improve. So that instead of having a tremendous loss in function with aging, the loss is very slight. The fact is almost any exercise at any age will dramatically improve your health. It's not just for the young. It burns off fat, strengthens the heart and the lungs, improves the body's use of oxygen. It reduces blood pressure, stress, tension at any age. And while exercise may not extend your life, the research isn't decisive there, one thing is clear. You'll feel younger. You'll feel like you lived more years. I think that exercise is even more important in an older person. I mean, it's almost as if you make yourself younger by exercising. As far as, like, the, the prime measure of fitness is a maximum oxygen consumption test, and it declines with age. But a person that stays fit that slope of the decline is less if they stay fit. And so it is. You're actually slowing down the physiological aging process. But there's something else here, something this man has discovered and most of us haven't. The word old doesn't mean much anymore. The fact is medical science and longevity are moving faster than we are. As people keep living more and more years, as we learn more about aging and disease, the word old changes meaning but our definition stays the same. We really haven't caught up with this, so we, we're still living with uh, attitudes about aging based on facts about aging that existed in the past, not the facts that exist now, and uh, certainly not the facts that are going to exist in the future when we become uh, age 65. And yet most of us still hang on to those definitions that might have been true once, might have, but certainly are no longer, and most of them are negative. If you're old, you can't run and play anymore. You can't earn a living or do anything very useful. You can't make love to your husband or your wife. Can't take on new adventures, learn new things. 
can't do much of anything anymore except watch the clock, give up living, and wait to die. The problem is most of us already have images in our minds about what it means to be old. So maybe it's time we talk to the researchers who study these stereotypes to find out which ones are true. First, that most of us eventually will end up in a nursing home. Turns out that's not true. Of all persons who survive past 65, any of us that survive past 65, 20% of us only will ever have a nursing home experience. And it may even be extremely brief, like the last moments of life. That most of those over 65 will become senile will suffer from Alzheimer's disease. That's not true. For people over 65, it's between 5 and 10% of all individuals actually have the disease. That even if we don't become senile, our intelligence will decline. Again, that's not so. We call it uh, crystallized intelligence. So we continue to acquire words. Our vocabulary increases. Our breadth of knowledge, our fund of knowledge increases that most old people lose their personality, become rigid, crotchety, depressed. It's not true. People tend to maintain the same kind of personality that they have throughout their entire life. And they don't change in the direction of becoming more depressed, more crotchety, less well-adjusted. That the elderly aren't productive anymore, can't keep up with younger workers, not true. As a matter of fact, uh, most older workers are better than younger workers because they have more experience with the jobs, and obviously experience is the important factor. And finally, that old age is the worst time of life, an age of sickness, disability, confusion, loneliness, despair. Again, it doesn't have to be that way. One should expect, based on normative data, that these kinds of problems will not be faced by you rather than will be faced by you. Uh, or if, the, if you do experience these problems, it'll be very, very late in your, in your life. And um, I think that's really the message that gerontology and, and, and uh, the people studying aging are trying to convey right now, is that uh, the expectation is for a very normal lifestyle, well, well laid into one's life. Whenever that's not true, it's a reflection either of some social failure that's programmed people into obsolescence because they haven't been able to continue to enjoy the prospect of new learning, or a disease failure. It's not essential to the natural condition of growing old. It doesn't have to be that way. It does not have to be that way. Of course, you may ask, what's wrong with stereotypes, misconceptions about growing old? What harm do they do? And what has all this got to do with how long we live? The answer, of course, is that right or wrong, what we believe has a way of coming true. If you tell someone often enough that he's old and valueless, that she's not pretty or useful anymore, that old age is terrible, dark, and frightening. Too often those messages become convincing. We do grow old and then give up. We grow old, become depressed, and then surrender to aches and pain, idleness and regret, and finally death. Surrender because we got talked into it. Now this may seem like a long way to travel to say all this another way, but why is it that near the Black Sea in the Soviet Union, there are people called the Abkhazians, who often live to be 80, 90, even 100 years old, who believe that old age is the most respected, valued time of life? Is that a coincidence? If we looked at old age as they do, if we treasured old people, would more of us try to reach old age, and then once there, fight to stay alive? It's no coincidence to this old woman. Dr. Lila Bonner Miller, a psychiatrist still practicing medicine at the age of 83. Don't tell her about white hair, wrinkles, the beauty of being young, the miseries of growing old. She doesn't want to hear about it. Wait a minute. I'm not going to talk about growing old. I'm going to talk about living today here now. I'm 83, and I've been living a long time. But I've had marvelous experiences, and we all have. We, you know, when I was young, they taught us in colleges that your brain wouldn't work after 65. I've learned more since 65 than I did but before 40. Well, you say, how, how, how did you learn this? How did you... You see, we have an interesting life from the day we are born to the day we die, and it ought to get richer and richer and richer, and it can. She received her medical degree in 1924, the first woman to graduate after a full four years at the University of Virginia Med School. In 1931, she married a Presbyterian minister, bore three children, 
and practiced internal medicine until 1960, when after eight years of study, she switched to psychiatry. She was 61 years old. Now, a few months before her 84th birthday, with aches and pain, a hearing loss and cataracts, she offers therapy to the poor, the mentally ill of Atlanta. She says being old isn't important, at least not compared to being alive. I am an old woman, but if I think about my being old, I'll be sick tomorrow. I got to think, think about living, what I've got to give that folks need, and I want to give it. You've got to know I've got work to do. I'm telling you, if I have nothing to do, I can't get up. I have to choose and be active. Does that make sense? I think it does. Mm -hmm. Dylan Thomas, though, said it another way. Do not go gentle into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. And that rage may help keep you alive. You just can't tell this old woman to retire. Work and purpose to her are the same thing as life. And you can't also tell older people, slow down at your age. That may be the worst advice. You know, the thing they may need is to swim, as my mother does, 78, you know, a quarter of a mile a day, to uh, walk, to involve yourself with other people. The last thing you may need is to sit in your room and be inactive. And yet some of these tried and true so-called old aphorisms of the physician, take it easy, what do you expect at your age? Uh, with age comes suffering, and a lot of other malarkey is just that, malarkey. Baltimore, Maryland, about 10 years ago, a man is killed in an automobile accident. His 11-year-old daughter is severely injured. Unconscious, she's taken to the shock trauma unit at University Hospital, connected to a heart monitoring machine. Eight hours later, something happens that puzzles a young psychologist working at the hospital that he's been trying to solve ever since. We had watched how her heart was changing during the day. And later in the day, when there was a quiet period, we simply had a nurse go up and hold a hand and never said a word. We held this little girl's hand. And when she did that, when she let the little girl's hand go, heart rate elevated as high as it had been in the past 20 minutes and then precipitously uh, fell and then went back to its cycle. Uh, so that we could see in the most acute conditions, uh, even in somebody who apparently was in a coma, that this act of touch seemed to have a rather profound effect on the heart. Such that when the nurse let the little girl's hand go, her heart rate immediately jumped. Jumped, right. What happened? Even in a coma, the girl's heart rate went up, then dramatically down, all from the touch of a stranger's hand. Why? What is the biology of human contact? How much do we need each other, not just to be emotionally happy, but physically, to stay alive? Or looked at in reverse, how deadly is loneliness? I think loneliness, uh, everything else equaled, is probably the single most important cause of disease and death in the United States. Loneliness? Lon loneliness, I think, uh, uh, if you look at divorced white men in the country, take one specific uh, category, under age 70, their coronary death rates are double that of married men. Their cirrhosis of the liver death rates are seven times higher. Suicide rates, five times higher. Uh, automobile accident death rates, five times higher. Lung cancer death rates, five, uh, double. Uh, the st you drone on the statistics. A woman has died. Friends and relatives have come to pay their respects. Linda Stansel was 87 years old when she died. She left no husband, no children, no one except nieces and nephews. For most of her life, Linda Stansel lived with her younger sister. Neither had ever married. Now, you decide what this means. The younger sister died on June 4th. Linda Stansel died 10 days later, June 14th. After a lifetime, two deaths come 10 days apart. It's probably not a mysterious business. Some studies show that it's the immune system. The immune system is that 
system in our body that protects us against infection or interior disorders of one sort or another. So even our very biological forces operate in disarray after there's been a grief, a loss. That's a very, very important thing to know, and yet very frequently people are not aware of that. If you look at the health data published every 10 years, you'll find an extraordinary connection between loneliness and death. In fact, the data suggests that a broken heart is precisely that. What astonished me was the consistency of the data. That is, the single, dwindled, and divorced always have higher death rates, uh, almost uh, virtually from every cause of death. Lunchtime, the Washington Square nursing home in Warren, Ohio. 80-year-old Lucy Saylor, former school teacher, comes to visit, comes to feed her husband, Charlie, who suffered a stroke some months ago and has been here ever since. So has she. Seven days a week she's here, from mid-morning until mid-afternoon, and then she goes back home. And her reasons for coming aren't all that complicated. Because I love my husband and he misses me. I have nothing else to do. I have a little girl comes in and cleans for me every week. And just to go home, what's the sense of going home to an apartment and sitting just by yourself? I might as well be here with him. And some days he's good, some days he's sharp, some days he's all mixed up. And if I don't get here by 10.30 in the morning, he's running around the halls here. Where's my wife? Where's my wife? Where's my wife? And so that's, uh, that's why. I just happen to love him. I want to be with him. She has no family left, no sons or daughters, no brothers or sisters. All she has is him, which may mean that each day she has a reason to stay alive. In some ways, of course, women have the worst of it. They live eight years longer than men. Four times more often, they have to bury their mates. And according to the American Institute of Stress, if a woman loses her husband, her chances of then dying from every known major cause of death are 3 to 13 times as high as a woman whose husband is still alive. Look around. There are a lot more women than men in this nursing home, and some of what you see is the damage from a husband who died. They forget to eat. They become confused. They may fall. They may fracture a bone. Their diabetes may become out of control, and they have to become into the hospital. If they lose their husband? Sometimes these things do happen. Sometimes I can name you off patients in my facility that they, they, they came here as a direct result of their husband expiring within a given period of time. And the families can actually tell you, well, mom, this happened to mom after dad died. This happened to mom after my stepfather died. Why do you suppose? What is this fragile, vital connection between heart, mind, and body? Is it the immune system, as Dr. Butler suggests, or high blood pressure, as Dr. Lynch now believes? This is new ground for medical science. The answers aren't in yet, but either way, if our concern here is longer life, then happiness, some kind of emotional bond between our work, our family, friends, even our pets, may end up being just as important to long life as diet, exercise, anything else. But then, Perhaps none of this should be too surprising. The list of physical diseases and physical changes that can be influenced by emotional factors is a very long list, from dandruff to heart disease to uh, the, the obvious one is ulcerations. We know that stress produces ulcers, and that's a physical problem. It's a physical disease state, and it's obviously influenced by one's emotional well-being and the way in which we're able to cope with our day-to-day -day activities. So it's, it's, it shouldn't be surprising that if, if emotional and psychological factors are going to be such a strong influence in, in physical changes in the body, uh, that those, uh, those uh, links are going to also be there when we're talking about longevity. We have one more stop to make, an old brick house on East 24th Street in Brooklyn, New York. The woman in the window is a 63-year-old child, Gladys Goodman. She is senile. She has Alzheimer's disease, a fatal, incurable, untreatable disease that has become the nation's fourth leading cause of death. After the age of 65, the odds are at least 1 in 10 that you'll become senile to some degree. If you reach 80 years of age, the odds rise to about 1 in 5. And the impact that this has on the health system of the country is enormous uh, in terms of economic impact and uh, nursing home costs, medical costs, 
the, the, it's just a staggering financial burden. And beyond that, the, the cost to the families involved, to, to the social fabric of our elderly society, uh, is just, it's incalculable. It's, it's staggering. So, how did it go today? So it was fine. Seven o'clock on a Thursday evening, dinner time at the Goodman House. Norton is a textile salesman. His daughter, Roberta, is an attorney. And Gladys used to be his wife. Come on, give me five. Now, she is little more than a child. She can't remember who she is, or where she is, or even words to have a conversation. The last time she spoke to her husband was the winter of 1980. Every day, seven days a week, he dresses her, bathes her, helps to feed her, watches over her, at night puts her to bed. I can't walk away, and I can tell you, I have a lot of people that I know, both friends and acquaintances, and even relatives, that will pose the question, well, meaning when are you going to, when are you going to put her away? When are you going to start living for yourself? You have to think about yourself. What do you say? Uh, my answer to the thing is, I'm not ready yet, and she's not ready yet to be institutionalized, to use that cruel word. There is, however, a great deal of hope, perhaps not for Mrs. Goodman, but for the next generation of Alzheimer's victims. At the Brookhaven National Lab, for the first time, researchers have been able to photograph metabolic changes in the brain of an Alzheimer's patient. At very least, this will help diagnose the disease in living patients and locate where the most damage has been done. At Letterly Labs in Pearl River, New York, Dr. Ray Bardis, as well as others, has been investigating chemical changes in the senile brain and they found only recently, as information passes from one brain cell to the next, a particular chemical is required, especially in the short-term memory part of the brain. In the Alzheimer's patient, that chemical, acetylcholine, is no longer manufactured so that the information is lost and can't be remembered. This has led to other experiments where acetylcholine is artificially fed into the brain, temporarily at least improving the patient's ability to remember. Of course, all this work is very experimental, very preliminary. We still don't understand Alzheimer's disease very well, and so far, there is no cure. But it's not too far off, in my judgment, because it's a major breakthrough to know that at least something about a system in the central nervous system that's affected. There are many diseases that we don't understand, and yet we can treat. There are many medications which are extremely effective, but we don't even understand their mean, their mode of action, like aspirin, for instance. So I think that there are very good possibilities that with proper investment of research dollars that we can begin to unravel some of the mysteries of senility and mitigate it, if not end it, in the next 20 or 30 years. If you think he's too optimistic, consider the work being done at the Geriatric Study and Treatment Program at the NYU Medical Center. You know After you interviewing, are? testing, examining over a thousand Alzheimer's patients in the last few years, researchers here have designed the first diagnostic scale to measure the various levels of senility. The executive director of the project is Dr. Stephen Ferris. Well, I think as new basic research and basic information about what's going wrong in the brain and its causes, uh, coupled with s research on treatments, progresses at the rate that it's going today, and it's actually going to greatly accelerate. Uh, I'm confident that within, certainly by the turn of the century, I think this is going to be a manageable disease, uh, perhaps a preventable disease. For some, however, the disease is preventable today. For at least a handful of senile people, there is a cure right now. It's called an accurate diagnosis. Some researchers estimate that between 10 and 20 percent of all those described as incurably senile don't have Alzheimer's at all. Instead, they are malnourished or anemic, alcoholic or overmedicated, any one of which can cause the symptoms of senility and cause the doctor to give the wrong diagnosis. A very good example are antidepressant medications. Let's say a woman has lost her husband, and that's the usual case because women outlive men. And the doctor sees her, she's tense, he puts her on some diazepam, Valium, to calm her down. She doesn't seem to get any better, she's inconsolate, uh, 
her daughter is 3,000 miles away in another part of the country. And she goes back to the doctor where he's called in and he increases the dosage of the diazepam or he puts her on another medication, another psychoactive medication. Before you know it, he has a confused older person. He misinterprets, not out of any malevolence, but the doctor misunderstands, thinks, my God, she's going through a senile state, suggests that she be in a nursing home. She can't be taken care of at home. She's on her way now to a death sentence called senility and nursing home institutionalization. And it all began with a normal, understandable grief reaction, which was not met by any kind of counseling or any kind of uh, appropriate, well-thought-out response, but by zapping the person with excessive medications. That's happening today? That happens today. For some of us, of course, the prospect of extending human lifespan is a frightening idea. In fact, some might say, we live too long already. Why add even more years of arthritis, senility, blurred vision, poor hearing, aches and pain, the trials of being old? It seems a pessimistic but a fair question. And yet some scientists argue that at the heart of that question is a misunderstanding. There's a big misunderstanding. When people think about living long, they think about being old long. And I'm talking about, and modern gerontology is talking about, extending the period of youth and middle age and being old for about the same relative period that we are today. People are living to be 150. They should be young and middle aged if they're 130 and old the last 20 years. But why stop there? If science can envision a lifespan of 150 years, then why not 200? 300, even 400 years. I know it sounds fantastic, but is there a limit? That's a controversial question in science right now, as yet unanswered, but there are two basic views. First, that there is a time barrier, a genetic limit in each living cell that will allow us to live for a certain number of years, and then no longer, regardless of what we do. But there's the other view, that how long we live is determined by how long our body continues to repair itself, that death is not a function of time, but disrepair. As we discussed earlier, if we could beef up, somehow reinforce the body's own protective chemistry that defends us against disease and degeneration so well when we're young, then our lifespan would depend on how long we can keep that defensive system active and alive. I think we were bad at the point where we are going to find out which one of those views is correct because uh, because of the, the, the biomedical research going on, the biochemical research going on right now, um, we're beginning to have, the, we're beginning to see those kinds of breakthroughs already occurring. And uh, so if, if in fact there is no biological genetic limit to the lifespan, we should be able to see tremendous increases in, in uh, longevity in, in the very near future. But when? How near is the very near future? in time for a man or woman 70 years old today or 60 or 50 or 40 or will the imagined breakthroughs come for a generation not yet born there's no way to know extending human lifespan is still theory what science will find when they find it how old you can be and still benefit by it are still questions without answers nonetheless there are a couple of things we can say first that there are more researchers today trying to find the answers to aging than there ever were before, and the pace of their work will accelerate. And second, while we wait, for you and me, there is some danger here. It lies in our optimism about medicine and science, our excitement about the promise of new discoveries, breakthroughs, and cures. And yet, like most things, long life and good health won't come from a single magic pill yet to be invented. It'll come the usual way, with good luck and hard work, the luck of who our parents and grandparents are, and hard work in things that aren't magical at all. Watching what we eat and drink and how much, not smoking, getting plenty of exercise, even in old age, staying active, involved, remembering the vital connection between love, loneliness, and long life. And in all of this, getting the advice and counsel of your physician. Because in the end, I wonder if most of us wouldn't agree. How long we live will never be as important as how well. Mm -hmm.